Good morning. Uh, welcome to stage C. Um, before we start, uh, I would like to remind you this is entirely run by volunteers and we need volunteers, most notably for running the audio and video system. We also need people to run the bar, to run the car park and all kind of stuff. So uh, yeah, if you have not volunteered for shifts yet, uh, you should really go to uh, volunteer.emfchem.org and it's very easy. You can sign up and look for shifts that work for you and just sign up and, sh and show up at the volunteer uh, tent. But for now, I'll leave you with uh, Sam Machin who is going to talk you to you about SMSs. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, right, good morning. Uh, my name's Sam uh, Machin, or Machan for those of you who are French. Yes, I know it's comical, Sam thingy. Um, it's fun. So uh, I work for Nexmo right now. We're a sponsor, so I should say this is kind of a sponsor talk. Um, but I have one slide that just keeps the sales guys a little bit happy. Um, I'm going to try and talk about some technical stuff. So I apologize for the salesy slide, you'll see it. Um, so yeah, my talk today is uh, SMS can do what? Um, we are an SMS API provider platform um, and voice and other numbers and telecomsy things. But I'm going to go through some of the kind of more interesting, weirdy little um, things, clever things you can possibly do in SMS, depending on your phone and your carrier a little bit. But um, and it's kind of an interactive demo. So if you've got a phone, um, get it out, and there's we can you can play along uh, as we go. I've got numbers for a few countries. So if you're not UK, I've covered a few. And I'm sorry if there aren't the others, but come and see me afterwards, and I'll point a number in your country if we've got one, and you can play with it later. Um, so this is me. Uh, my job title: developer advocate. So I supposedly do this stuff for a living now. Um, <laughs> badly. Uh, my email, my Twitter is at Sam Machin. Everything is at Sam Machin. Um, I'll put the slides and the code and whatnot online uh, afterwards. Okay, so a little bit of history. Um, SMS, the first text message was sent um, just before or around Christmas, early December 1992. Um, does anybody know what it said? No. Well, actually, probably the, when they say this is the first public announced one, I'm sure ones were sent in labs when they were making sure it worked. But Merry Christmas, yeah, it was. I think it was called Merry or Happy Christmas. It was the the irony. It was sent to some Vodafone executive at the Vodafone Christmas party because they just got it working. Um, so you know, the, the executives are all at the Christmas party getting drunk, and the techies are in the lab desperately trying to get the SMS service working for launch. I guess on first of January. Um, so he sent Merry Christmas to his like. VP's phone, um, and that was the phone he was carrying at the time, uh, an Orbital 901. Um, battery life, I think, was around eight to 10 hours. Um, and you know, there's the, the handset, and then the rest of that was the battery, and you kind of had a, sl uh, a sling. But the executive probably had somebody to carry his phone around for him, you know, if he needs, come here, I want to make a phone call, and pick it up. Um, at first, it was mobile terminated only, so you could only receive messages on handsets. Um, if at my first phone in 98 still, um, which shows my kind of age, could only receive text messages. I remember getting quite excited when I upgraded to one that I could also send text messages. Uh, uh, what was interesting was well, you couldn't send, a, in the UK at least, a cross network. So if you were on Vodafone and somebody else was on Orange, you couldn't send between you until um, 1998 in the UK. I'm not sure about other countries. But that was kind of a big thing. You had to be on the same network as a friend to send a text message to them. Um, unless, like me, you spent New Year's Eve 97, I think it was, working through an entire list of SMS center numbers that I downloaded off probably a bulletin board, maybe not even the web at the time, reconfiguring my phone so that me and my mate on Vodafone and one-to-one -one could send messages between each other. Um, we routed our messages through a gateway in South Africa, um, which meant we could send across network, and it was free, and this was like incredibly cool. Um, I was a very geeky child. But uh, yeah, that, that was kind of some, you know, some so I've been hacking SMS for, for quite a while. Um, so, probably teaching you guys to suck eggs here, but what is SMS, or text messaging as they like to brand it? The short message service, or the is the sort of thing. Uh, it's a 140 byte payload sent between a mobile station and a short message service center. So, I'm going to get into all telco talk now, but a, mo a mobile station is the standards name for your phone. Uh, the short message service center is a mostly Unix box somewhere inside the your mobile operator's network. There are some out there that still run on VMS as well, um, which you know is a little bit old school. I think, well, the company that made the VMS-based one has now been merged in with other companies that was Logica. But I'm pretty sure as of a couple of years ago, certainly there were still carriers running VMS ones. Um, 
they don't like upgrading stuff very often. They like banks. Uh, it uses the telecoms network signaling system, um, SS7, so which Hadley asked me if I was going to talk about SS7 off at the beginning of this, and I'm not going to talk much about it. SS7, yeah, I, it's, it's become quite interesting in recent years. I, I've kind of played with SS7 for years and gone, this is really boring and horrible. This is how telecoms networks signal to each other, um, but there's some really interesting vulnerabilities. Um, the Chaos Computer Club talks last that Christmas before last had a whole bunch of invulnerabilities, and it turns out that basically if you can connect to the SS7 network, you can pretty much do anything, because it only really assumed that only trusted people could connect, and if you connected, you must be a good guy. Um, that worked really well until they started privatizing telcos. Um, <laughs> you know, back when telcos were basically governments, it was like, oh no, we can trust each other, we're just governments. Um, and now there are a lot more of them. So um, I'm not going to really touch on the SS7 side of stuff in this talk, because... Um, Yes, you can do really cool stuff, but it's still fairly hard to get a connection. This is kind of stuff you can do with your laptop and a little bit of Python and our API. And also, probably my bosses wouldn't particularly like it if I talked too much about kind of SS7 hacking. Um, we're, we're not really at that level. Um, messages, they're, sent, they're stored and forward in the message center. So actually, when you send a message, you're not really sending it directly to a phone. You're submitting it to the message center. It's generally, traditionally, storing it in a database, then looking up where the recipient is and delivering it to them. Um, kind of like SMTP, I guess. But um, so, so it, it is a, a store and forward based protocol, which is possibly where some of the delays can come in. So how does SMS work? Um, I, this is awkward because I can't point at the screen. But if you look on the left, we'll start off here, you have your mobile station down there. Uh, the BSS is basically the radio network, base station subsystem. Um, a whole bunch of stuff, towers and controllers and things that, that makes up the radio network. Uh, the MSC, Mobile Switching Center, is, so there's loads of TLAs in telecoms, three letter acronyms. Um, the mobile switching center, you submit your messages through there. That's kind of the phone exchange, basically, that's serving your, your area, um, your city, typically. So you su submit the message through the MSC to the SMSC. So in your phone, somewhere is configured a, an SMSC address. It'll look like a phone number. Um, normally, it's sort of on the SIM. iPhones do it a little bit differently, but um, the, the phone knows where to send it. That was the thing I was changing numbers of back in the 90s to, to route via the ways. So you submit it to your SMSC. Um, your SMSC goes off and looks up in the ho HLR, which is Home Location Register, to say, where is this recipient? Um, so it looks at, you've sent the number, it says, where is this person? Uh, it gets back an MSC address for that person, and then sends it down back the same kind of way over to their MSC. Fairly simple. Um, these little MOFSMs, these are the kind of SS7 messages, mobile originated forward short message. SRISM is send routing info for short message, so that's the interesting one that you can exploit for all kinds of stuff, SRISM, um, for kind of finding location, because basically you can just ask a network which, which MSC, which often tell you at least which city is this phone in, and it'll say, oh, they're here. Um, so you can, banks use it now to tell if you're roaming for card, um, card lookups and stuff. So some of your bank, maybe if you've got, they've got your mobile number, might be querying the location of your phone to find out certainly which country you're in, because you know if you suddenly spring up and start making transactions in Thailand or something and your phone still says it's in the UK, that's a fraud indicator. Um, and then MTFSM, mobile terminated. So I'm going to skip through some of this because it's fairly boring to most of us. Um, the other interesting thing just to point out is when you're sending it cross-network, so if I'm sending from 3 to EE, um, I would always use my home short message center. So uh, the, the person that's originating it submits the message to there. But that short message center takes care of delivering it directly over the recipient network's um, mobile, center, mobile switching station. So it doesn't kind of route through message centers in your recipient's network. Um, traditionally, there are then sort of hacks, evolutions that carriers have put in this to sometimes kind of trick it, to say, no, 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 route it to a database where we can do filtering and spam and, and that kind of stuff on there. But uh, this is the sort of standard way of SMS working. Okay, so on to the slightly more next movie stuff. Um, how do companies like us connect? So we're an SMS API. We'll, um, so we're doing the badge SMS stuff, which you know, I can talk on later if we've got time. Um, but we don't obviously have bunches of handsets sending it. It's not like we've got you know, rows and rows of, of no old Nokia phones with serial cables plugged in, and when you submit to our API, we're just picking one of those. Um, there are some providers out there that do things like that, um, particularly the sort of spammy ones and stuff, but um, that really doesn't scale to the kind of quantities. Um, so there is another piece in the network called Application Originated. So we, this circle logo is Nexmo, um, we connect in to a SMSCs, basically, to carriers around the world via a, a kind of a 
um, a wholesale type connection, this SMPP protocol. So now we're back into sort of IP and stuff that's a little bit more, um, a little more web friendly. Uh, it's kind of a, well, at least internet friendly. Um, so we, we, we have these sort of socket connections and the, these kind of connections that take like six months to get from a carrier and you know connect up and, and agree stuff and sign contracts and have 37 conference calls and, and all that kind of thing. Um, and it, it, you know, it's painful. Um, but so we submit messages into a carrier's SMSC, which is then delivered to the handset. So we have to kind of take care of knowing which SMSC we're gonna send it to. So we typically do that on number ranges. Some countries we look up, carriers provide us kind of proprietary APIs, databases to say, oh, this is where, you know, we, we give them a number and go, is this number yours? And they go, no, this number belongs to Vodafone or something. So we then go, oh, okay, we'll deliver it to Vodafone. Um, in the UK, we just do it on number range. Interestingly, so we'd send to whichever um, originally your number was on. So if you've got like an orange number um, that you've now ported to O2, we would send it to orange and they just take care of sending it over the radio network um, because it's, it's cheaper that way and it kind of balances out. Um, they charge you to look up where the number is and they charge you more to find out what network the number's on than just to transit a message for somebody else. So a kind of quirk of pricing. Um, in France, we, I think we have a live database. Um, so yeah, that's kind of it. Uh, this is the salesy slide. So this is why Nexmo is kind of good. Um, we have lots of connections. Basically, we try and be as close to the, the carriers and stuff as we can. We don't go through. A lot of this industry kind of works on this idea of, um, of aggregators and tiers. So traditionally, it was set up that if you were like a little hobby developer or small side project and you wanted to maybe spend $20 a year on text messaging, you know, put some credit on with PayPal and send your messages, you'd be dealing with a company sort of, you know, down at the, the third or fourth tier. And the companies that were connected to the mobile operators were at tier one. And there was a kind of aggregation wholesale arrangement, but you would actually forward. So you would send your message, but it might be forwarded through three or four other companies before it got to the mobile network because, you know, mobile networks won't deal with you unless you're going to send them 10,000 messages a month, say, or something. So then somebody gets that connection and they split it out to people who send them 1,000 messages a month and they split it out to 100 messages a month and, and so on. Um, one of the things we kind of went to do differently was to try and flatten that model and say, we'll get all the direct connections and we'll do big, fat, you know, high volume customers, but also we'll have a product that will extend right down to the, to the long tail. Um, so yeah, we have a whole bunch of connections. Um, the interesting is that we can deliver to messages to all but three countries in the world. Um, North Korea, um, strangely enough. Uh, Svalbard in the Arctic, because there's no mobile networks there. <laughs> and um, Western, somewhere in Western Africa, again, because there's no mobile networks there. So we pretty much have global um, reach. We can even deliver to sort of places like Iran and stuff like that. Um, sometimes through a kind of local partnership, but, but that's our strong point. And we have numbers in uh, about 80 countries right now. So uh, I'll come on to that. Cool. Okay. So that's kind of the salesy background. So I should have asked as well, though I'm not going to be able to see, but how many people had heard of Nexmo before this talk? One, two, three, four. Okay. That's good. Less is good because then I can kind of say, look, I've told all these people about it and I get more, uh, more brownie points. So. Right, so I'm going to do some uh, some demos. Um, I'll put the number for the UK on all my slides, but if you're in Belgium, the Netherlands, and Germany, I've just uh, literally that's what I was doing before I started. I've also set up um, numbers in those countries on Nexmo that will work for the demos. So if you've got one of those phones and you'd rather send, I don't don't ask me about roaming costs and if it's expensive and things like that, but generally I'm pretty sure even if you're roaming, it's cheaper to send a message to your home country than to send an international one because it'll probably come out of your minutes. Um, Standard disclaimers, please phone your carrier's customer services and uh, ask them how much it would be to send a message to this number when you're in the UK. We'll stop for about half an hour now while you're sitting in a queue and, uh, and wait for them to answer you, if you're lucky. Um, and the UK number down the bottom there, for, uh, 07520 619 Okay, so start off with something really basic. Um, basic SMS, so we can send 160 characters of text. Um, I said before it was 140 byte payload in SMS, but we get 160 characters in that. That's because SMS uses a weird thing called the seven bit alphabet. So we don't use the standard eight bit ASCII type alphabet. We use a subset of that, or GSM does, which is seven bit. So a few, uh, few the top, half the characters basically in ASCII are kind of not supported. Occasionally, if you've ever seen a message which has like, replaces it often with a question mark on most phones because of a, a strange character that hasn't come through to your phone, that's because somebody's sort of not got the encoding quite right and, and they've tried to use a, you know, a strange apostrophe or, or a, um, an accent or something like that that hasn't worked. Um, 
most of the European characters are certainly supported in the 7-bit alphabet. Um, GSM was a kind of European standard, so, so they did at least do that. It wasn't just you know, the North American set, but um, so most of the common uh, Grave and, you know, um, so I guess, I'm going to assume you now French, German, and Scandinavian certainly have little accenty characters um, are supported. Um, but yeah, so we send that uh, 160 characters. You do a weird nibble swapping, converting 7-bit to 8-bit will just make your brain hurt. Um, I was trying to do this at 6 o'clock this morning, which really wasn't a good idea. Uh, um, so if you want to send hello to that number, um, you'll just get back a, a hello world response. Um, this is pretty boring, one, but this kind of shows the, uh, the stuff. Um, so this is then using Nexmo, basically, so a virtual mobile number. That 07520 is a number that Nexmo have, and we, I've pointed that at some code that I've got running on Heroku, which just responds based on the word you've sent. Um, so if you just, just, these just, it doesn't matter if it's case sensitive, I sort that out, but just send a message saying hello, you should get back hello world. Have somebody done that and got a response? Please wave if I know it's working, that's good. <laughs> Always a risk. Deploy code half hour before talk. Okay, so Unicode or unicorns. Um, again, we have 140 bytes, but Unicode is a 16-bit um, encoding character set. So you can send a message as Unicode on most modern handsets now, um, certainly iPhone, Android, Windows Phone, that kind of stuff. Um, what that means is you actually only get 70 characters in an SMS instead of the original 140. Um, so if you send an emoji, for example, you'll get back a um, a Unicode message, which has an emoji in it, um, if you send emoji. So this is kind of a, an interesting one to watch out for if you're building stuff and doing things with messaging where you're paying per message, because if you set Unicode because you're sending emoji or Japanese characters or even some of the extended um, you know, European character sets and stuff, you're, you're limited to 70, or you'll be charged per 70 characters. Um, we, we, our API supports kind of longer messaging, you come to, but we chunk it up and charge you per 70 characters. Um, the thing that often gets people here is, as soon as you put one Unicode character in the message, the whole message obviously becomes Unicode. So people are like, oh, I've got my message, and I've just changed one character, and now it's you know, costing me twice as much. And it's like, ah, yeah, you've, you know, you've gone to a Unicode character for some internationalization, and now you're in 16-bit, and trying to explain this in support tickets, or even worse, over Twitter, is not easy. I think I'm just going to slip that bit of the talk and put it on YouTube and just send people the link. Um, so yeah, emoji, did that work for anybody? Just if, if you do it and it works, just just wave, shout, something. Um, we'll do, probably won't have questions at the, the end, we won't have time, but uh, we'll do that. So yeah, emoji, um, or general, all the Unicode characters, um, Asian, I say, support that on the API. Long messages, um, so concatenation. Uh, you can obviously send 160 characters of text in a message, but you can, within the signaling protocol, you can actually send, say, this is part one of uh, up to 255. Um, APIs will support different ones. I believe ours is 10 for most countries. But you can join together messages. So okay, if you send long, you'll get back a four-part SMS. But on your handset, it'll look like one. Um, this is bacon ipsum, by the way, which is just, I believe, Dan Nell's prayer he says at night, every night before he goes to bed. But... Uh, so, yeah, what you'll find as well is that this will probably take a little bit longer to respond, because actually, we send four messages back, um, and the network, your, your, the network sends those four messages to your phone, but your phone will only alert you when it's got all the parts of the message. Um, so the response takes a little bit longer. Um, if you send 255 part message, it can take a long time, and then it really fills the screen up. But it's a great way to kind of spam someone's inbox. Um, 256. Uh, so yeah, all messages. You're, at this point, you actually have 153 characters per message. Um, because it's 134 octets of data in 7-bit, uh, and you lose six octets for sending the kind of header that says this is a multi-part message, part one of X. Um, so it's, it's sliced up slightly less. But that, that response you get back is uh, four, four SMSs, 556 characters. Have a wave. If cool, working, good. Wow, loads of messages. I'm not going to do anything with the numbers, by the way, at the end of this. I don't think I'm even logging them other than probably the log on my Heroku box, but I'll... I'll buy the code, so don't worry, I won't be spamming you. We don't like spam. Um, okay, flash messaging. Um, this is kind of a bit more of an obscure one that people might not have heard of. Um, these are kind of, so this is definitely one which may or may not work on every handset, on every carrier. Um, certainly everything I've tested it on in the UK, so most iPhone, iPhone it works fine, and on most of the Android handsets. Um, 
but if you just send a flash, this is uh, what's got sometimes called a class zero message. So the idea of these messages is, it's quite if you send flash and then lock your phone or go back to the home screen, um, it's one it appears on the home screen of the phone uh, as a pop-up, but doesn't um, save to the inbox or anything by default. Android now lets you save the message, which is kind of on the iPhone, you can't actually save that message. Um, and generally, the sender ID isn't visible either. That's the one I've just realized I've forgotten to put a message, the demo in here, but um, it will just um, appear and disappear. So it's kind of one-time notifications, um, that kind of thing. You know, this message will self-destruct. Again, it was great before Android allowed you to save them because you could send stuff that you didn't want people to be able to kind of send or, you know. There were various positive and probably negative uses for that. I should buy, we do have an acceptable use policy, and if you're using it for spam or spoofing or fraud or anything like that, we will kind of block you and, and ban your account and stuff. Um, so please don't. Uh, interesting, the iPhone now has a little thing at the bottom that says, why did I receive that message, which now um, links to a kind of a page on the Apple support thing that says this is a flash SMS or something, um, and kind of explains a little bit of, yes, it's a text message, you were prob it's probably spam, I think is what they say. Um, but, you know, there, there are some interesting, I'm sure people here will find interesting legitimate uses for it. Um, <laughs> and less legitimate, Glenn. Um, okay. So, voicemail indicator. Um, this is kind of a fun one. But the uh, message waiting indicator, so the way your phone, voicemail system says to your phone, you have messages, or the little spool indicator, as it's sometimes called, is actually sent as an SMS, um, as a carrier. And you can set the number of messages that you have, up to 255 messages waiting. So if you've got anybody that's really, really obsessive about inbox zero, and you just want to kind of wind them up a bit, um, yeah. So I think I um, actually I sent 99 in hex, which is why it's 153 here. But uh, if you get that, you should find your message waiting indicator is now saying you have 153 voicemails waiting. Um, and you can clear it. Should I tell? Yeah, OK. Uh, <laughs> or we could just ruin your inbox now. But, uh, if you send clear. Um, It'll reset it. We'll actually set it to zero. So I apologize if uh, if you did have messages waiting. I should have said that at the beginning before you sent it. Um, but uh, if you send clear, basically sending clear, what you actually do is you don't really clear the message waiting indicator. You just say zero messages, and the phone kind of sets that back to zero. Um, there are a couple of other ones which don't tend, certainly don't work on the iPhone and a lot of Androids. But there is within the spec um, fax waiting indicator as well. So instead of a spool, you get a little um, fax icon. And email, which is only an at, and I believe video, and I think telex as well. Um, so you can set these message. Wait, there's loads of telex stuff in the SMS protocol um, for some reason. I've never seen anybody use it. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so you know, if you want to really want to, why have I got one new fax waiting in my mailbox to somebody? Um, that's, uh, yeah, you, you need to find out which handset. Certainly, this was all kind of originally written for the old Nokia's and Ericsson's. Excuse me. Um, which, you know, did this, and um, I believe, actually, at Orange, we did even use the fax waiting indicator. We did, like, a fax mailbox on the voicemail thing years ago. Because um, everybody's cleared their voicemails that they're not stuck with a massive inbox thing. Wave if you've got problems, and I'll have to come and figure out how to fix it. Um, and all, I say all these words and codes are up now, so you can use it later. Um, cool. Okay, five minutes. This is good. Okay, this um, this is kind of the last one of the demo. Um, there's one other actually I forgot to talk about. Um, I mentioned that the sender IDs, when you need numbers, you can also send alphanumeric sender IDs. Um, so you see sometimes when it's a string of text, you can't actually reply to them, but you can set 11 characters. So we can set like, um, often you know your bank might use that or the network and something to say from Lloyd's Bank. Um, and you know there's no verification. We do have a kind of block list of if you try and spoof those, we have like a, a blacklist of numbers you can't you can't set on our network. Um, but you could set EMF camp, or you know, I often send my demos from Sam Machin or Nexmo. Um, I think Nexmo's on the block list other than my account, actually. But uh, yeah, you can also set text. Sorry? No, because space isn't supported in alphanumeric sender IDs, actually. It's, I believe it's literally, it's a very limited character set. It's 11 characters, and uh, you can't, if you put a space in it, it'll get dropped. Um, so yeah, you can't, yeah. You could probably do like Leet Speed, you know, Barclays with a five or something like that. Uh, quite a lot you occasionally see now these phishing things in the paper, you know. My elderly mother was received a legitimate text message in the same app on her phone. And it's like, no, there's no such thing as a legitimate text message. Just don't trust text messaging. <laughs> it's a brilliant thing. It's really useful. But, you know, don't rely on, yeah, the sender ID. Sender IDs can be spoofed very, very easily. Um, so, you know, just because you had a sender ID, as can caller ID, um, which is another whole fun 
things to talk about. Anyway, uh, replacement SMS. So this is this is kind of cool. Um, this has some some really interesting legitimate uses. Um, the one we suddenly thought this morning is the kind of two-factor auth, sending kind of passwords, things like that. Um, you can overwrite a message that you've previously sent to someone's phone and replace it, um, which, you know, is, is cool. And also, you can really freak people out. Um, so right now, if you send, uh, the only, the, the kind of limitation with this is you have to, s the first message you send, you have to say, this is one I'm going to, I want to be overwritable. So if you've sent a message to somebody last night because you were drunk, and you really, really want to get rid of that message, don't come and ask me to replace it. It's too late. That's gone. Um, but you know, if you'd sent it before, maybe an app someone wants to build for their phone that you know switches on replacement SMS as soon as they start texting after 10 at night or something would be really handy. The morning after, it's like, would you like to revoke this message? One pound in app purchase. Um, <laughs> genius. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so you send a message. There's actually 10 um, replacement or nine replacement slots, one to nine, you can set. So you can say, replace message to one, so you could replace in the last 10, only from the same sender via the same message center on the phone. So you know you can't overwrite other people's messages, um, possibly if you fake the sender ID, um, but it's not guaranteed. It kind of has to be via the same, the same pipe. Um, so we send show, and you guys have all got win. Um, so you know, you're all winners. And uh, now if you send replace, it should change. Some Android phones we found, if you're in the inbox and you don't come out and go back, um, it shows them both. And then as soon as you exit back from the messaging app and back to it, it is gone. Um, but you can make a message disappear. Can I have a wave if that's somebody's had a message disappear and it now all says you've lost, isn't it? Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's kind of cool, I think. And that's about it. So yeah, that's me. Um, we've got... Not really enough time for questions. I have about one minute, but um, I should do this one. So we uh, we have a Nexmo tent down by stage B, a little marquee and some blue flags. I've got some swag, got some camping mugs and blankets. Um, come and ask me questions. Come and talk stuff. We've also done the messaging app on the badge, which hopefully you guys are getting probably now. Actually, I think we're giving out a ten, so I probably have a whole stack of things. Um, you have some cool. So there's. I'm not sure if it's pre-installed or in the app store. You can download the messages app, and we'll allocate you a phone number. Um, if you want to keep that phone number on a Nexmo account after the event sign up for an account, um, come and see me with your account API key, username or just the email address, um, and I'll chuck a load of credit on there for you and transfer that number on so you've got the kind of, you can keep this stuff running or you can play with this. Uh, the code and the slides will be online. Uh, it's a Python Heroku app that's just sending how to send these types of messages from our API. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah.